Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Greta Hewson, and I'm the production coordinator at Film London Artists Moving Image Network, or FLAMEN for short. And we're the organizers of the Film London Jarman Award. Um, I want to say good evening, everybody, and welcome you to this special online in conversation presentation. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Jarman Award itself and mention uh, a few events that we have upcoming before I hand you over to Rosa Tyhurst, who is the Assistant Curator of Exhibitions and Public Programmes at Spike Island, and of course, Sophia Almeria. So founded in 2008, the Film London Jarman Award supports and recognises artists working with the moving image, and it's really there to celebrate the spirit of imagination and innovation that exists in the medium across the UK. And of course, the award is named after the visionary artist, uh, activist, gardener, writer, and filmmaker, Derek Jarman. And it comes with 10,000 pounds worth of prize money. Each year, we invite a jury to select a short list of six artists. And those artists this year are Adam Faramawi, Georgina Starr, Guy Oliver, Yasmina Sivic, Larry Achiampong, and Sophia Almeria. And Flamin and the Jarman Award organize a tour of the work of those six artists in the shortlist uh, in partnership with different venues across the UK. And we're very pleased to have Sophia here this evening to represent the shortlist. Due to the frankly bizarre circumstances that we're all living under, this year we are doing a hybrid tour. So we have got some events online. So if you haven't had a chance to watch Sophia's work that she made in partnership with Waikin Sin on the Spike Island website, and don't worry, uh, it will be available to watch still after the end conversation and until midnight tonight. And if you're going out after this and that still doesn't give you enough time to watch it, don't worry. We are going to be doing another online screening of the work of the shortlist next Thursday in partnership with G39 in Wales. And there will be a, uh, another in conversation with the artist Adham Faramawi. So we hope you join us for that. If you're keen to find out who the winner of the Jarman Award is this year, and maybe you've already picked your favourite, we will be announcing with an online presentation on the Film London website on the 23rd of November. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And if you want to hear more from Sophia and watch more of her work, she will be presenting uh, short films and reading some of her new writing on the Whitechapel Gallery website on Saturday, the 13th of November from 1 p.m. And that's also free. So please do join us for that. Finally, I just want to say thank you so much to Spike Island for hosting us this evening. And we absolutely love working with you. I want to particularly say thank you to Rosa, Olivia and Jane for all of their help. I also have to thank the Whitechapel Gallery, who are our partners. And of course, Arts Council England, without whom none of this would be possible. And I'm really hoping that I won't be in this box next year and I'll be with you at Spike Island for another event. And finally, Sophia, thank you so much for being here as well and sharing your work with us. I'm really looking forward to this in conversation. So over to you. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Greta. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Rosa and I'm Assistant Curator at Spike Island, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone this evening to the Film London Jarman Award 2021 conversation with one of the fantastic shortlisted artists, Sophia Almeria, um, where we're going to be discussing her collaborative work with Viking Sin titled Astral Bodies Electric Make Up. Before we start, I have some housekeeping to get through. Um, Spike Island's public programme seek to create an environment for critical and open-minded discussion. We strongly encourage you to use the chat function through YouTube Live to write any questions you may have throughout the event, and I'll field these to Sophia as we go. A reminder that any aggressive, discriminatory, or intolerant comments will be removed by our moderators in keeping with our aims to create a respectful and generative environment for everyone involved. For more information, you can read our code of conduct, which should be in the chat box now or very soon. And so to introduce our guest this evening, Sophia Almeria is a Qatari-American artist, writer, and filmmaker. 
Her cinematic videos explore post-colonial identity, imperialism, and counter histories, weaving together music, literature, oral history, film, and dance. Her fractured non-linear works are often cast against a science fiction backdrop and explore the, re the revision of history, the isolation of individuals through technology, and the corrosive elements of consumerism and identity. Her work has been exhibited in the Guangzhou Biennial, Take Britain in London and the New Museum and the Whitney and many other places. Her writing has been published in Harper's Magazine, um, Badoon, and she has published multiple books, including a memoir, The Girl That Fell to Earth, and more recently, a book of poetry called Sad Sack. Sophia also wrote the television series Little Birds, based on the collection of poetry by Anais Nin, which broadcast on Sky Atlantic last year. Okay, so hi, Sophia. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us again. And um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, we'll be talking mainly about the work nominated for the Jarman Award tonight. Um, but I mean, of course, we'll talk about other aspects of your practice and other films at the same time. Um, and a heads up again to anyone who hasn't seen the work, it's available to view on demand, um, along with the other five nominated works on the Spike Island website until 12 a.m. So if you fancy some late night artist film viewing, you know the place to do it. Right, Sophia, thank you so much again for your generosity. I'd like to start with some kind of quite introductory questions to introduce the work to our audience. And um, perhaps a good place to start with is the title, Astral Bodies, Electric Makeup, exclamation point. Um, could you tell us a little bit about its significance and how you came to it with your collaborator? Yeah, I think um, it's a really funny title to say out loud because when I hear it in my head, when I read it on the page, I hear a very high pitched voice kind of screaming, saying a spell going, Astral Bodies, Electric Makeup with a compact in hand. And that comes from, uh, it's a reference to the transformation sequences in um, the uh, classic um, Japanese animated series, Sailor Moon, which was a very um, important uh, reference for both Joaquin and I, um, and has been for a very long time in both of our works separately. And um, so we came together um, thinking around transformation and the show that it was um, originally shown in was called Transformer and that it was commissioned for. And so we sort of started from that shared love of that, like the weird syntax of the spells, which you can see in like sort of Sailor Moon wikis, there's like a a really nerdy and granular like level of knowledge that is out there on the internet of like every particular um, uh, spell and sort of um, trigger for the transformation of the sailors into soldiers of the universe. So really? <laughs> that, that, um, and it makes sense, of course. So it strikes me, and it also strikes me that the word makeup is, um, is kind of quite ambiguous because obviously, you know, you're making up for something, you're making believe or kind of makeup products for the face, but it's quite nice that you intend it as more of a, um, as a spell, as a casting. Um, for our audience that might not be familiar with Sailor Moon, could you just say a few words about, about it? Um, sure, yeah. Well, Sailor Moon, the, the general gist of the story is that there are these normal everyday teenagers who are on planet Earth and um, they have these fly-by-night side jobs as um, pretty soldiers saving the universe and it's a really really special story that really grows over the various seasons and there's a lot of like queer characters in it there's a lot around like sort of solidarity and friendship and and collaboration, which I know that we'll talk about a little bit here. And each of them have their own sort of special skill set. So it's quite astrological as well because the sailors are broken up into like Sailor Mars, Sailor Mercury, Sailor Venus. Sailor Moon is the main character whose name also means bunny in Japanese. Um, but she is the sort of central figure um, who leads the pack. And then as you get out into the outskirts of the solar system, you have these sort of more um, esoteric characters 
who, um, for example, um, one of the sailors, my favorite, Sailor Saturn has a silent glaive, which like is the is this weapon that it can like destroy time, and so it's quite cosmic and and uh, yeah, it's just something you can really get lost in. I highly recommend. You should check it out. It feels like COVID destroyed time a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Everything's gone a little bit. COVID. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so as you alluded to, I'd like to ask you a little bit about collaboration as it's um, quite an important part of your work. Um, and I've really enjoyed, especially how you've spoken about it before. Um, and so specifically, kind of how long have you been working with Waikin and how did you first come to start working together? Well, um, Waikin is a very important person in my life and has been since the first time um, I saw them perform um, here in London, and it was a very um, it was a very particular moment in my life. And I reached out after that night, or a little while afterwards, because I kept on thinking about the performance. And in a lot of my work, um, apart from Beast Type Song, I've never appeared on camera in my work, and usually my um, I suppose method is to find the thing with uh, someone who is a performer. And in the case with Joaquin, we actually um, started our collaboration in a much more intimate space, which was these um, ser this series of three events over the course of a year at the Whitechapel Gallery, which were um, very small, uh, ticketed events, but which were for um, not like female non-binary people who um, wanted to come. And it was a really incredible sort of, um, I suppose, how could I describe them? The evenings would be sort of held by works that I was working, that I was writing. And then there would also be um, intermittent films and then Waikin would do a performance and each of them had their own sort of um, arrangement and setup. And they became quite cathartic spaces that were, um, I think in a way kind of gelling ideas that ended up being in Sad Sack. And the last one culminated in Waikin actually tattooing me in the space while while we were performing um, with uh, with the um, Wesson, which is a um, it's like a brand or a symbol that uh, Bedouin in the Middle East use for their livestock. And so in in the writing, there was this story about um, livestock and goats and my family and my grandmother's um, tribes Wesson. And so, yeah, they were very particular and special um, evenings, which eventually led to us collaborating on a couple of films together. And Joaquin is a director and, and a video artist in their own right. Um, but these, these moments of like confluence for us have been very generative and special. Yeah, Wa Joaquin's an amazing artist. <laughs> Um, I've really enjoyed their work before. And so the workshops kind of um, culminated also in an exhibition at Whitechapel, BCE. Yeah. Um, right. Could you talk a little bit more about that work? And BCE is big clit energy. Um, that was the joke, but it was also a sort of creation myth, um, which was again, sort of a, a sci-fi film reference. It was, it was conceived in, in a sort of um, origin story format that actually happens at the beginning of David Lynch's Dune. So you just have uh, a figure talking to camera in front of the universe and telling the story of the beginning of time. And across from that piece was um, a similar scene of um, an outtake from a film that I made called The Magical State. Which was, which was the creation myth of the 
um, Wayu tribe in Colombia being told by um, being told by someone from the Wayu tribe, and yeah, so except with the backdrop of Earth, so they were sort of speaking to each other across this gap inside of the White Chapel space. And speaking and well, referencing that I think was in the first time um, astral bodies was shown for the Transformer exhibition. Mm. There were so obviously it's um it was developed for a two screen a two channel two screen two, two screen work. Um, and when we were talking before, you were saying the dialogue between the two um, screens was quite particular. Could you describe maybe the installation a little bit and um kind of how yeah how it might have felt a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, it, the scale was a lot, um, it was much larger in the transformer space, but I really like it, the sort of call and response between two screens um, in, in certain scenarios, well, for certain sort of subject matters. And in that space, it was, um, there, the floor was a reflective surface. There was a sort of portrait piece, which you'll be able to see if you do watch it. Um, on one side of the screen, we had to adapt it to be able to show online. And then there was a 4-3 um, screen also like leaning against the wall. And they they were each doing different things and it was still referencing the Sailor Moon sort of format. So there was a, this like very complicated um, thing that we had to do with the transformation sequences with the portrait piece, which was, we had this sort of like uh, stage that was rotating and it was a continuity nightmare especially with the really incredible latex outfit that Joaquin was wearing for it blowing in the wind and um, yeah it was oh, I'm getting I'm getting like dragged back down into the memory of the actual shoot which is always my favorite thing to talk about because I feel like that's that's the fun stuff but um, please please yeah. go there <laughs> I'd love to hear more well, all of the there's there was a lot of things getting tangled up, um, and of course there are like gears in the stage and 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 fans blowing and um, and yeah, time tangling. So yeah, the I'm not sure. Um, God, it's been so long since I've physically been in, in a space with work, which I'm quite excited to be here in my gallery um, in London at PNI, going to finally install something after years. But um, yeah, it's different. And you have in both the BCE Whitechapel show and in the Transformer, you have this um this thick kind of plastic strip curtain. Mm. Why did you decide to kind of use it in both in both works? Um, it was a sort of, there was a, almost like an abattoir aspect to the, um, to the, using those PVC curtains that felt like a sort of rift. Um, they're transparent and not bloody, but it did feel like it was a sort of a reference to a tearing apart and a, and a drawing back together, like the audience moving back and forth between the spaces. And it was the same sort of thing, I think, with the um, with the 180 Strand show, and it felt also appropriate to the subject matter. Not to mention the sound conditions, the small buffer <laughs> in, in the time space continuum. <laughs> For me, looking at those images, also I started thinking about the materiality of um, of Wyken's clothing as well. There was mm -hmm. something there about textures and kind of quite. Um, quite quite like specific in them and um could you talk I mean maybe this is a question for Waikin but um could you talk any more about the outfit itself yeah that would definitely be a Waikin question but I mean I think um I mean my dream for the for that piece would be that it could show in like a room full of slime and, and slipperiness but there's a lot of health and safety things involved that would uh disallow that particular condition of the install. Um, so yeah, the the outfit was very, very much a sort of, I think, a second skin kind of, um, I guess, effect that was desired and I hope achieved um, with these sort of like flay strips coming off of it. 
um, which are really enhanced with the spinning and the, the fan, of course. It's, um, if you check out the Sailor Moon transformation sequences, I hope that everybody is like YouTubing it right now if they haven't already seen it. But there are these like sort of ribbons that explode and come off of the bodies of the sailors um, in, in some of them that are, I think, like the most sort of, in my memory of watching it as a young person, like that in particular, like that explosion of like coming out of the self and and then becoming stars and then and then like re um, like rematerializing into this different form was was like one of the most vivid visuals and so that was why we were really sort of looking for a ribbon effect. Um, and also the background of course, which um, you were describing as dust. Um, Maybe it's a Philip Pullman reference there potentially, but um, yeah. I was reading I was reading an interview with you and you were saying that all you want to watch is plotless ambience, quote, like nature documentaries or screensavers, end quote. And it really made me think of the background because um, it is kind of like this technicolored TV snow that you could imagine as a background or mm. one of those kind of windows screensavers. And um, yeah, I suppose it does reference what you hopefully references what you were saying about Sailor Moon and it kind of sp splitting up into thousands of stars. I'm glad that you brought up Windows 95 because that was a literal reference in that in that case. Yes. <laughs> Except instead of the sort of endless abyss of, of outer space, it's just, yeah, if you can imagine an evaporated um, um, a, a celestial astral body. That's what it would be. Very smart, sort of a supernova space. Um, could could we talk a little bit about the music in the film, which is kind of this kind of slow, soulful kind of cosmic saxophone knee piece, and then has these playful kind of more, I guess you'd call them cartoony kind of interjections throughout. Mm -hmm. And did you, how did you and why Kim kind of work on that? Um, well, we went to a studio and worked with a saxophone player who we were trying to get specifically the different tones of the chakras. And um, as each, like the, the piece sort of rises um, through the chakras. And that was very much how we sort of aligned the text, which I can have written for it. And um, so, yeah, it was, a, um, it was a really special process. And I worked with the sound designer, Joan Amy, who also did um, these types on on that piece and yeah it was a really it was a it was it's interesting to sound design a non-space that only exists in your imagination and I hadn't I don't think I had really done that before beyond sort of my essay films that are found footage but this one did did have to align somewhat to the sort of visuals and um yeah I mean that was a that was a a different process for me, I suppose, because I do like, I mean, the sound design, sound design is like one of my favorite parts of making films. Um, and as I am not a sound designer, I get to collaborate with really amazing people on trying to find the space and the references, for example, um, which add like a very important layer for me. Um, and that are only, I suppose, audible or trackable by those who know. So there were, yeah, lots of little details inside of that that were special. But I think the most important thing about it is the is the tonality sort of changing mm -hmm. and sort of rising before the transformation happens. And we sort of like make, it's also like a making up with yourself because in a lot of ways, I think that the text that like he wrote was coming from a, um, I suppose the way that the transformation happens, or it, it was like a meditation in a way, um, or intended like as, as a meditation on, um, I guess, finding oneself again and making up with oneself um, after having broken apart. So in terms of like, I guess 
the fullness of like my my work and the sort of subject matter that I deal with this was a very intimate and personal one that um, that was existing entirely inside of the realm of like uh, emotion and and also fan like fantasy for both of us and so it's quite an unusual piece if you look at like my work more generally um, because it's not hinged to sort of um, the dismantling of, of, of history and then the rewriting of it or um, sort of the other kinds of research that I do. Exactly. I, I um, really enjoyed what you were saying about it, it being a film of pure fantasy, which I think we kind of need at the moment <laughs> um, or definitely needed. And it's um, it was yeah quite an, a really amazing experience to watch it, which hopefully most people have or will be doing soon. Um, and a quick reminder, if anyone does have any questions um, about fantasy, Sailor Moon or anything about the film or the Sophia's practice, please um, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, favorite sailor. What is, yeah, what is your favorite sailor? That's, um, maybe we should do a poll. Um, so um, at the transformation part in the film or this, this moment where it changes from kind of this cropped kind of iPhone format to the more 4.3 kind of television format, um, there's the, the kind of hand starts reaching out to, to Wykin and um, it, it's almost, it's, it felt like it's this kind of moment where the viewer becomes really implicit in the film. It's almost kind of the breaking down of the fourth wall potentially. And um, it also really, for me, the material choices again was so spot on in terms of this kind of glossy latex and the, the sheen of this kind of satiny glove. Um, I was wondering if you could talk really about that specific moment when the when the viewer or the I suppose you was kind of reaching out. Um, well, it was definitely a sort of a fourth wall breakage. Um, the glove is is from a I think it's, it is like a what Sailor Moon wears, or what those what the characters wear. But it's um, I guess when I when that sort of idea came of like of that trend of that moment when like the hand behind the camera not just the gaze but the like the touch of the sort of i guess that sort of violence approaching on that track that then like grabs uh waking at the heart um the reason that i use the word violence is also because that i think that probably a lot of people here might recognize that um, from sort of like Jallo films and and the sort of gloved hand always being a perpetrator in cinema and um, and that hand like then trans like if you pull away and it's and Joaquin is uh, holding himself um, in this very sort of uh, state of like a fluttering heart and and it i suppose was um that's like the moment of makeup for me is when yeah like the i don't know why that phrase like the hunted becomes the hunter or whatever but like the, the like the Felt like becoming the full, like the fullness of oneself, basically becoming a um, real and embodied. So, yeah, that's that was also a difficult um, thing to match that shot coming and going from it. But it's been a very long time since I've seen that piece or spoken about it, but. It's really nice to be able to revisit it right now. Oh, it's, it's really it's really nice to talk about it. And it, I was um, when we were talking before, it was reminding me of um, your work, Mirror Cookie, which, funnily enough, was one of the last exhibitions or last works I saw before the lockdown in in Milan. Um, and that work kind of references this self help practice of mirror work, 
um, where one kind of says loving, positive self affirmations in a mirror. And I was wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about that work potentially and um, any possible connections between, between the two pieces. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, Mira Cookie was another example of um, my having encountered a, a performer uh, out in the world. I met Bai Ling in India at a film festival and I had been a fan for a long time of her blog. And in this sort of typical, you know, tabloid early 2000s, um, sort of moment, she was clearly like going through a lot and we met and became friends very quickly. And I felt very moved by her wisdom and all of the things that are never, um, I think that are very rarely like given space, especially for actors of a certain age and especially for a Chinese American actor and working in Hollywood and working in Hollywood at a certain period in time in Hollywood, which of course since has become, uh, has a lot has come clear about the kinds of things that were and still are going on. Um, I was actually with Bai Ling when the, um, some of the, well, when, the Weinstein stuff started coming out and um, we were about to shoot this piece. And so it was very much like on, in our conversations and the whole week that we were doing that piece, like, um, yeah, there was a lot about like being looked at and also um, all of the sort of traumas. So it felt like it was a very, uh, I, know, I know that it was a very, um, healing uh, space that we created um, both for Bai Ling and certainly for myself, but she said as much um, around working together and also working with a crew who were really like holding her as she became, she was very vulnerable and very um, open in that piece. And I think that that's what makes it so strong is that it's, uh, it really is like Bailing's openness um, that still moves me. And inside of the installation, there's a, um, a, a, a little secret. If you open the drawer, there's a tiny photograph, baby photograph of Bailing um, as a child. And and that was a really special gift that she added um, and gave to us to include. Um, because there's so much that's unsaid, the words that she's saying in that piece are very simple and they are based on um, reflective mirror practices of um, self-help, as you say, but using the camera as a reflective surface um, instead of an extraction um, or an extractive sort of drill was something that I still feel dubious about whether or not it was successful, but I think that the experience that Bai Lang had in it was similar to doing mirror work. But again, it's one of these situations where we'd have to have Bai Ling on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course. Um... I, I didn't know about that, um, the picture in the drawer. That's um, you missed yeah. it. <laughs> I'll have to try and go and see it again. Um, so about secrets, in the, um, in, the, in the short video that you um, um, gave to uh, Film London as part of the, the award, you said um, something about Derek Jarman and secrets. And I just wondered if you could expand on that and also kind of um, allow, you to, allow you some space to talk about Jarman um, and his influence on your work and um, how you feel about being nominated for the award again. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny because I found myself in Dungeness a couple of weeks ago and I've, it's a pilgrimage that I've been wanting to make for a very, very long time. I think that I first came to Jarman's work um, 
when I was at Goldsmiths and I, I, um, I just, I remember, yeah, going on to, on a sort of like very deep dive into his oeuvre um, and wanting to go on this sort of route down to Bench nice to see the garden and the sound ears. Um, at the time I was in Kojo Eshin's course, um, oral and visual cultures. And so that was something that we were trying to do as a group, um, but it never materialized until a couple of weeks ago, quite magically. And I, I um, had quite a moving experience um, walking up to the, um, the house and the garden because I almost couldn't believe it was real, but the, there's, a, there's writing on the side of the wall. There's a sort of poem, which has been, I don't know exactly what it's made out of, but it's, it's illegible. If anybody out there knows exactly what it says, I would love to know. Um, it seems almost, it's like old English, like Chaucer or something, or maybe Shakespeare, who I know that Jarman um, was interested in. But um, yeah, sitting there in like a, in a, very, on a very stormy moment and trying to like decipher the runes on this wall, on this ruin, or the ruined text felt like a very, um, yeah, very of a piece with so many of the things that I'm thinking about, especially in terms of um, posterity and history and the future um, and what writing even means and whether or not it's important. Because I think that as a writer by trade, I'm increasingly feeling that maybe because I've been trapped in my chair for so long, but um, I'm very much doubting the uh, whether or not language is a trap and whether or not um, writing is a, like the, the symbols that we hold meaning in are not enough and not fit for purpose. And so seeing this um, obscure, piece of writing that I may never know what it says, um, but still having it like evoke a feeling in me was a really special moment. And um, yeah, I mean, it's such a beautiful monument in a way to the person that Derek Jarman um, was. I'm getting a bit pensive now. Um, so why don't we, uh, we break it up with some, some questions from the audience that we have. Um, cute perfume addict um, asks about um, if you're only working with film or if you work with other mediums, what are they and how, if I might add some to it, um, how do you kind of decide which path to go down? Is it going to be a more collaborative kind of fantasy work? Is it going to be a you know, more realist historical work or will it be a book or a poem? Ah, um, good question. Thank you. Perfume. Um, the I mean, each 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 idea sort of finds its own form, and some things are not expansive enough to grow into um, into full blossom. I mean, I have the the amount of shrift that's just like lying in a file or on the floor is I mean, it literally is piles and piles um, of um, notes and drawings and sort of marginalia, which I know has some kind of value only just being around, but which will probably never sort of evolve into something um, that it has a skeleton or flesh. I think narrative is very central generally to um, the way that I frame work, even if it's not film. So for example, right now I'm working on some wall-based works, which do have uh, a narrative, but I really am enjoying it because it it can um, it doesn't have to be illustrative in the way that film I feel sometimes has to like really hold an audience, and especially if they're going to be generous enough with their time and sit with it, 
whereas like with something wall-based you you can walk away or you know move away from the from it if you don't want to be looking at it or spending time with it so that's been a sort of exciting new um, prospect for me i guess is yeah to move away from the things that i do as work also and i do love making films though just because you're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with and it's such a collaborative medium and, um yeah it is it does seem to be the sort of like natural route for the scale of some of the ideas that i want to share speaking of other new processes or systems you've recently made your first public sculpture um maybe not your first or you've made, recently made one <laughs> um, for the serpentine um a piece kind of that I don't know, I kind of saw alongside this video, perhaps as it encourages people to kind of slow down time for themselves. Um, could you say a little bit about the experience of making it and um, yeah, have something more kind of very public, I think it's semi-permanent, um, how, that, how that felt? Well, um, it, that was indeed like, that's the first time that I've had something that was that public. The piece was similar in a way to Astral Bodies and that I wanted to make a stage for a performer. Um, and Astral Bodies was very much that for me with Joaquin and for me Taraxos, which is in Hyde Park until April of next year, was uh, proposed as a portal and also that would be opened with a performance by Tosh Basco who only a few weeks ago came and did that, which was an incredible um, experience to be present at that day. And um, I'm still processing it because it was, um, it took several years to get that project made and having that, um, I guess, wish come true for lack of a better word was, was very moving and the, um, the sculpture took on different, some, I, th I suppose, has been accruing around it, um, meaning for me, um, especially as over, over COVID, it was, it became this sort of need that I was feeling to like have a pilgrimage or a place to go, a direction on a map to like walk towards in the city. And, um, and so in a lot of ways, I, it, it, even though it, it had originally been conceived as a place to go and be quiet um, as a sort of foil to speaker's corner where there are a lot of ideas and words flying around loudly. Um, it was a place to ground, but also to like fly. And it's also based on the dandelion, which is why it's called Taraxos. Um, dandelion's Latin name is Taraxicum officinale. And so each of, um, during the pandemic, I wrote a text, which will eventually become a book. Stay tuned. Um, it did find, it, I find that, that the, the amount of, um, the amount that has gone into that piece um, really does require a sort of a, a book to accompany it. But there was this thought that came to mind as like the skies over London were clear and there were no more contrails in the sky that a wish could be a form of travel and um, and so it's also a place that people are invited to go and think about loved ones who are far away or gone um, yeah it's interesting watching the public interact with it. Yeah, and that's until April, or it's up till until April. So um, hopefully you guys, some of the audience can come and see it if you haven't already seen it before. And um, and the book, so I can add it to my Sophia Almeria collection. When, when will that be? <laughs> we'll make sure that you shake it and, <laughs> and listen to the wind chimes at the top. And, and about the, the book, do you know when that might emerge? TBD. Okay. Great. Um, we have a question, another question in the audience from Jane, um, asking if there's um, any other kind of technologies or processes 
or um, mediums you'd like to work with in your practice that you haven't yet? Mm. Mm. Um. I mean, every I I'm so curious about. I I I didn't attend an art school, and I haven't been trained in any sort of particular art other than writing and journalism. So I everything. I mean, I would love to be able to paint. I would love to be able to use my body. I would love to be able to. Um, yeah, I'm open to learning. Is there anyone out there who wants to teach me? I'm here. Awesome. Um, thanks. And I think Tosh has written in the chat the actual words on Derek Jarman's cottage. And um, do you want to know them or do you want to keep it kind of a mystery? Oh, I can we have like one line, choose a line. Thank you, Tosh. Um, busy old fool, unruly son. Unruly son. Should I continue? Should I continue? Busy old fool, unruly son, why dost thou thus, through windows and through curtains, call on us? Which, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think, <laughs> probably don't need to say anything else. <laughs> it actually, I do, I, there is something that really special that that brings up, which is the, um, which is related to Taraxos, which is, I think, and also the astral bodies thing in that, um, yeah, astral travel, I think is something that, a medium that I would like to be able to work in and come to windows and knock on them and say hello to loved ones far away. Yeah, that, that sounds lovely. <laughs> uh, that. Yeah, um, I could do some of that as well. So we're just about at time, um, Sophia, I truly appreciate you finding the time to speak um, to us this evening and for making such a wonderful film. Um, and good luck for the prize. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. Um, thank you to Greta and everyone at Film London, my colleagues Olivia Jones and Jane Farham and the team at Project Native Informant. Um, another reminder that you can watch all the nominated films for the 2021 Jarman Award on our website until midnight. And if you have any thoughts, comments, or feedback on our nominated works or this event tonight, we'll be really grateful if you could share them with us via a survey. The link should be in the chat soon. Um, and we'll also send it out to everyone who booked after the event. Please check the Spike Island website. Um, if you'd be interested in coming to any future online events and for more information about our current exhibitions at the gallery, which is Vision Machines by Peggy Awish and Wet Room by Lucy Stein. And if you'd like to support more events and screenings like this, our exhibition and artist development programs and our community of artists here, please consider making a donation. We look forward to seeing you again soon, I hope. Um, Sophia, I hope we get to meet in person one day. And um, yeah, hope you all have a lovely evening. Um, yeah. Goodbye, everyone.